and welcome to our panel discussion on measuring the impact of student voice and partnership initiatives. Um, my name is Trish Behan and I'm the partner, student partnerships lead in the Office of Student Life at the University of Sydney. And I'd like to extend a very special welcome to both our in-person attendees, you guys, and all our attendees online. Um, we're really, really excited to have representation from over 26 uh, universities today and two institutes. Um, that's very exciting for us. So thank you all here and online for being part of this really important conversation. So as institutions increasingly prioritize student partnership, um, one of the challenges we see now lies in evaluating how effective our initiatives are and how we can ensure they drive continuous improvement. So today we'll explore methods, various methods and metrics used to assess student voice and partnership initiatives. And we'll discuss how these evaluations can enhance student engagement in decision-making processes. So we are joined by three wonderful panelists who I've had great pleasure to get to know over the last few weeks. And each of them bring a very unique expertise. Um, I'll start by introducing Satoshi Sanada. Uh, Satoshi is a principal policy and local engagement officer at the Victorian Schools Authority. And Satoshi will offer us insights into how student voices are integrated into policy decisions particularly in the vocational education sector and how the, their effectiveness is assessed. Uh, then we have Sabrine Yassine. Sabrine is on the steering committee, is a steering committee member of the Global Student Forum and National Welfare Officer at the National Union of Students. And Sabrine is a student member on the UTS Academic Board. And Sabrine is going to present to us a practical example from the University of Technology of Sydney, where the impact of student voice has been measured through their student partnership agreement. And finally, we have Professor Kerry Lee Krauss. Um, Kerry Lee is chair of the Higher Education Standards Panel in the Australian Government Department of Education. And Kerry Lee will share insights on uh, using evaluations to inform strategic decisions and improve institutional culture in higher education. So welcome, welcome, welcome. So we'll dive straight in into this very critical discussion. And I'm going to start um, with Satoshi. I'm going to pose a question to you, Satoshi. So um, I'm, the, I'm aware that the questions are not overhead, which is good because they're long and meaty. So I'm going to go through them quite slowly and clearly so you'll remember them. Um, so Satoshi, your work at the Victorian Skills Authority has focused on integrating student voices into decision making in the VET sector at national, state and institutional levels. And uh, noting that some TAFEs and registered training organizations already have their own processes for incorporating student feedback in providing strategic advice to the government. What feedback or indicators do you consider most valuable in ensuring these initiatives effectively empower students? Thank you. Thank you, Tracy, and thanks everybody for having me here. I um, just want to pay my respect to all the traditional owners of the land. As a first, my, uh, first generation migrant in Australia, that's a particularly important uh, thing for me to do. So I want to talk about two things uh, really quickly, and then there's more time for questions now. So I can um, talk further as well. So two things I want to talk about now is just to talk about quickly talk about the role of the VSA, the Victorian Skills Authority, and specifically my role as a principal policy advisor. And secondly, we'll, I'll tell you a little bit about sort of broad domains of metrics that we use to uh, measure success in our work. So first and foremost, the Victorian Skills Authority, it's an advisory authority that was set up in uh, 2021. Um, within the Victorian government, we report to the Minister of Skills and TAFE. Okay, now Victoria is a really interesting uh, scenario, I suppose, compared to other uh, jurisdictions. We've got 12 different TAFEs. We've got four different uh, dual sector, that's universities and TAFEs together. Each one of them has its own um, chief executive board and also it's a governance structure, right? Um, the beauty of that is we can do a very, what we call place-based uh, response to the local skills need and so forth. Now, the difficulty lies in the fact that I suppose there's lots of really interesting student voice initiatives that are occurring across the state, but they're not necessarily joined up. Uh, sometimes it causes duplication because similar sort of issues are being raised across different campuses and different campuses, sorry, 
sorry, campus, different institutions uh, deal with them separately. Okay. Um, uh, and as, as a sort of government that's sitting at the state level, uh, we don't really have a very clear oversight of what's been said, what's been done. And I think probably the most important point is that there are lots of uh, issues or opportunities or risks which rightly sit, sit at the institutional level, right? But then there's also our issues, matters that probably need to be dealt at the, at the sort of higher level, particularly given that that system, like, like university system, is nationally driven system. So there's rightly... Again, acknowledging that there are lots of really good stuff that's happening at the institution level is rightly things that we shouldn't expect institutions to solve, solve by themselves. So at the state level, that's where we come in um, as a advisory authority to the Victorian government, but also to the national level um, uh, government decision makers. That's you know your Job Skills of, uh, Australia, Job Skills Council, for instance. We have an ability to leverage students' voice so that they can actually meaningfully influence the policy decisions, the program decisions that uh, make a difference at, at large scale. So we have a distinctive role as a kind of, it's almost like a, an advocate at the sort of state level. You know, we, we got policies that get made up, up here at national level. We got institutions that are doing all the good things down here. Well, I shouldn't say down here, that's a very, yeah. yeah. I'm not saying we're, we're higher or anything like that, but we're, we're in this kind of in-between space where we interface, we coordinate what TAFEs do, but we also have a sort of influencing power at national level. So. So I'm, I'm, I'm leading the development of a strategy to actually enable that structure. Where we want to, where we want to get to is the point where uh, we will actually directly engage as well as indirectly through TAFEs and uh, dual sectors and to actually collate and synthesize the higher level policy level, I suppose, uh, uh, insights, you know, aspirations, needs, concerns by the students and use that to actually uh, uh, create a sort of really you know, clear shared understanding across the institutions, across the decision makers about what needs to change at the system level. Okay, so just, just wanna clarify that what we're doing is to, to play the role in that government decision making space, not at the institution level. Okay. So up on the screen, uh, there's, there's a, a diagram that shows the kind of like a really truncated version of what we do. Um, we have a document called Victorian Skills Plan, which has been uh, publicly announced by the Minister of the Skills and TAFE, uh, which commits us to taking actions. And Action 12 of the plan, which you can find online too, by the way, um, says that we will be setting up an inclusive VET system, which aims to provide a stronger student voice into education and training reforms. So that's a quite a strong claim coming from, coming from a state level minister, right? Um, now, the, qu the question then becomes, fall onto people like me and think, like, how do we actually do this exactly? Now, having worked in a student voice space in the past, so I come from secondary education space uh, initially, and uh, there are lots of issues and limitations of, uh, or precautions, I might say, of doing student voice, which I'm not sure I, I don't need to tell you all about. Uh, so what we have is a four broad domains of measures, which again, I'm not gonna read that, you can, you can read on the screen. The reason why we have these four things there is, is because there is a kind of almost like a reflexive relationship between some of these enable what we call enablers versus outputs and outcomes, right? So we, of course, we're trying to measure the outcomes of the student uh, voice and engagement, but we need to think about well, what are the outputs we need to kind of get to the outcomes and what are the enablers that allow us to get to the point. Now, once you start to actually talk, think about doing student voice, you realize that some of the enablers are actually um, enabled by some of the outcomes, if that makes sense. So for instance, and, and to, to put it into really concrete terms, for students to feel like they can feel psychosocially safe and speak into the government decision makers, and, and actually also to think, that, well, it's worth my time to actually come in and speak to the government, right? We need to be able to show to them that we are empathetic, we're responsive, we've got integrity, we hold up out of the account, all these kind of things, right? Um, so in other words, by having some of the kind of early successes, then we can sort of promote a more opportunity for learner engagement and collaboration, which creates more opportunity for greater number of stakeholders to have an experience interacting and working with learners, right? And these, these, these will probably continuously sort of, there's a kind of positive feedback loop in driving better practice over a long period of time. Now, we also note that in a particular third box there is, is a response to some of the kind of early feedback we received from our stakeholders saying that, well, we're doing all kinds of, well, there's already lots of really great 
uh, student voice learner engagement stuff happening, but then we all, all always hear from the same voice. We're talking about this kind of role role model type of students who've already got a lot of experience and exposures in the past. They've got, you know, typically they've got their able body. Typically they've got uh, uh, English as a first language. Uh, they've got sort of great high level literacy and problem solving skills and so forth. And that's that's really excellent. These students can certainly advocate for others. But, um, you know, if you speak to say, for instance, our First Nations colleague, for instance, right? If we if we can change the system in the way that works for uh, most marginalized groups in the society, then the system can do a lot for every student. So in terms of like a return on investment, uh, right? Like it, there, there's a lot, we, we, as a government, we need to be actually doing the best we can to speak to the most marginalized voice and make sure that these students again feel psych psychosocially safe to, to come and speak to us. So we need to make make us uh, make sure that we are trusted. So and the way we think about that is the, these four domains are like a, you know, it's, it's a barrel analogy, right? The system is only as strong as the its lowest common denominator. You can only fill up the water to the lowest stave that you've got. Uh, so we believe that uh, these four domains uh, should be um, pursued, measured uh, all at the same time. I don't think we can leave any of these behind. Now, I'm going to just stop talking, but yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of things that sit under each of these domains, which I don't have time to discuss, but as I said, I'll be around. So please ask questions, please catch me later on um, and talk further. Thank you so much, Satoshi. Um, and we're going to have plenty of time at the end of this session for Q&A. So feel free to make some notes if you have any questions. Um, I'm going to move on to Sabrine. Your turn. <laughs> awesome, great. Sabrine, Thank um, you. at UTS, the Student Partnership Agreement has been instrumental in fostering collaboration between students and staff. Can you discuss with us the process of its inception? challenges that you faced and how effect, how the effectiveness of the student partnership agreement has been evaluated since, including any methods or metrics used and how these evaluations have supported voice within the university. Awesome. It's a big one for five minutes, but yeah. thank you all for being here. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that we're on Gadigal land. Um, I'm going to tie myself because my friends and colleagues know that I like to speak, um, but essentially what I'm here today I'm going to talk to you about is a very practical example of student engagement and student partnership. So um, what you're seeing here is the kind of preface of the uh, SPA at UTS, so Student Partnership Agreement. And this was implemented two years ago. And what a student partnership agreement meant to us, um, and which was one of the very first ones in New South Wales, or the first one, is it's essentially a shared list of priorities between uh, university and the university management and student groups. Um, and what this did was essentially codify um, the goals, the, the aims, um, the obstacles that we wanted to face for the next two years as a university, both students and staff. Um, so again, a lot of this came down and I'll talk more about this as we go in and hopefully get some questions, was about co-collaboration, co-design and authentic partnership. Um, and if you look at some of the things I've highlighted, or you can, I'm sure you'll know how to read, but um. It essentially covers what we as students really wanted to acknowledge at UTS, which was about genuinely recognizing students as kind of uh, as engineers of their own learning, as leaders, as um, people who, again, students um, know what they want, students know what needs to happen to evaluate their learning alongside staff. And so essentially the inception of this came out of a very fortunate year where we had a lot of kind of strong student leaders who are at the end of their tenure, you know, about to graduate, had given a lot to the university over the last five years, um, had been president of the student union, had sat on academic board and wanted to be able to give back to the university and make sure that the students who followed them got the same opportunities that they did. Um, but a lot of what they had relied on in previous years, and this is including myself, was, you know, personal connections, networks, knowing your staff, being involved in the university space. Um, so again, it was a very high barrier, as Satoshi mentioned, people who already kind of involved to get um, to get to that point of, you know, student leadership and partnership. Um, so this document was essentially created as a tool to formalise these structures, formalise student partnership. Um, and over the last few years, we've spent uh, evaluating uh, the effects of this and we're currently working on 2.0, um, which is a bit different, which I cannot reveal yet some of the changes because we're still in kind of negotiations. And again, I, we take this process, which I'll touch on, 
it was a very serious process. It wasn't, let's just draft the document and, and sign. It was genuine negotiation. You know, we had each student group in the room. So we've got our student union. We've got all the students who sit on academic board um, and then all the students who run uh, the club and society. It's called Activate at UTS. Um, and essentially each of these student bodies um, and two of them specifically have their own council and that council needed to vote on this. These these conversations that were had ha happened over a course of months um, where we were deciding our priorities where, again, this level of accountability and buy-in um, was so, so key to the inception of the Student Partnership Agreement, agreement and its following success. Um, so essentially I might just touch on what you mentioned the challenges were. Uh, so as I uh, briefly alluded to, we are a university and UTS has a very thriving kind of social um, student social space where a lot of the student leadership kind of comes from quite organically. And again, everyone had their own priorities. Um, there was some overlap in, in say uh, services that the student union provided and services that the clubs and societies provided. So it was a very interesting time where they could kind of sit in a room and be like, okay, what are your obligations? What are my obligations? Who does UTS acknowledge as being the real student representatives? So a lot of these questions, that allowed for the students who had kind of been elected into these roles, maybe it was to put it on their CV, maybe they genuinely cared about this aspect of, you know, student life, um, but it made them kind of sit down and evaluate what their like true priorities are. Um, and again, because they had to make those representations and almost, again, they almost had to justify themselves to be able to um, kind of put their name on this paper. That is something that was quite formalized. Like we had the vice chancellor sign on. And I think there's a the previous slide, there's a quote from him about um, student partnership and agreement. And again, this is quite a a big jump up um, from kind of the informal channels that we had previously when it came to student leadership. Um, and again, some of the other challenges were that for the staff, obviously, you know, letting go of some of the um, kind of the 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 steps they were able to take without kind of consulting students. These were real formalized processes that they they had to come to the students. Same for the students. They had to fit their campaigns and their initiatives within kind of the formal frameworks, especially um, uh, hopefully you're familiar with the SAF fee that all students have to pay and student unions get a portion of that fee. Um, but what that money is spent on is very um, obviously it has to be transparent, transparent, sorry, but it's very important as to um, deciding what the priorities for the student union is that year. And the good faith that came with the student union working with the university is another kind of outcome of this agreement. But essentially when it came to evaluating the success, um, we had three main channels. So first, um, our Following this, the signing of this agreement, a student advisory group was set up with the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Education, Kylie Reedman at UTS. And I will have to say that some of the successes of initiatives such as the such as this depend on the personalities. It depends on do you have student leaders who are engaged, who are willing, who, you know, want to give up their time, who believe in the process? And do you have, you know, management or staff who want that genuine um, collaboration with students because they know that it actually tangibly impacts the outcomes for students on that campus? Um, or are they looking for a tokenistic, you know, piece of paper, which again, that was some of the pushback we got um, when it came to like voting on it and, and passing it through councils was, well, this is, this is just going to, you know, be put up and collect dust and it's going to make, you know, the UTS look good. And it's going to do nothing for students except bind us to this agreement. Um, and again, I won't get into the weeds of it, but there was a lot of, um, because it was, a, it was a formalized contract, a lot of safeguards put in place. Um, and one of them, I might start from high level, is the fact that this agreement is reviewed every two years. So there is an option for the students or management to opt out after two years. They can say, it's not working. No one did anything the last two years. I, I, I don't think we need to be part of it. And, and they can decide not to renew it. However, again, that is what allowed us to properly um, evaluate the agreement because right now we're in the process of it to do the second edition um, is that we are now evaluating the successes of it. So we are looking at, um, and I've got examples of some things that were in the agreement. Um, we've been able to track the changes in policy within UTS that have actually come from the agreement. So there was one thing about sexual assault and harassment. So something that was originally agreement was that if a case is brought up, um, it should there should be one point of contact. The student should, shouldn't have to go through multiple different people, you know, counselling, the clubs and societies, the UTS report, 
um, service, they should go to one person to avoid re-traumatization. And we saw that policy implemented so we could track and, and evaluate that. Things like sustainability measures, and I'm sure in your universities, you've all had a lot of discussions about AI. We created a UTS ethical AI policy, um, which was also included in that agreement very early, two years ago. We were ahead of our time. But um, so that things like that, we have reviewed and tracked and essentially that getting to the data of it all, we've um, kind of collated what's been done, what hasn't been done. And we've allowed each student stakeholder to go back to their groups um, and, and give their perspective through, you know, surveys and, and informal channels um, as to what they felt. So then now when we come to the negotiation table again, um, we can review that. Um, we also, I'll probably end on this, is um, we have a student council liaison group at UTS where the student elected students make representations to UTS council. I think at UCID it's um, the Senate, um, I'm not sure, but uh, this is where, again, because a lot of these things, the onus is on the students, we wanted to make sure, considering the power imbalance in some senses, we wanted to make sure that both uh, groups were reporting back. So um, the deputy vice chancellor will come and bring to council um, and report back on where they are on each initiative. And then at the student council liaison group, uh, she will come back and have a written piece of paper saying where they are on each priority. Students report back and that continuous work and collaboration. Again, very, very, it's very high level, but you can see how this takes genuine work. It takes genuine um, effort, engagement and buy-in. Um, and it's a lot more than just like a piece of paper, which is really what we try to avoid. And um, I'm sure I'll actually get lots of questions, but this initiative has truly transformed the way that student leadership has been able uh, to operate at UTS and obviously management's initiatives. And now as I hopefully graduate at the end of the year, um, we've created a system and a structure where student voice is genuinely, genuinely recognized um, as being important to um, the university and how it operates. So yeah so much Sabrina and um, I do remember when we first spoke and you told me that you were developing version 2.0 it just made me really think that you guys have jumped, jumped right in and assessed this measurement measurement and, and taken everything so um, seriously and the amount of work that is going into this is fascinating so I hope you get lots of questions about this at the end um, can you hear me now Okay, I'll speak up a bit. Um, okay, so thank you so much. And I'm going to um, uh, pose a question to Kerry Lee. Um, so Kerry Lee, uh, drawing from your leadership experience, how can the evaluation of student voice and partnership initiatives guide strategic decision-making and foster sustained improvements in student engagement and institutional culture within higher education? Hmm. Well, we don't have all day, but we really do need all day. I think we could listen to the, the work that you're doing, Sabrine, uh, all afternoon. Fantastic segue to uh, how to actually uh, look at this work strategically. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the land we're on today and also members of the uh, First Nations community who may be with us and whom we represent here in our um, many university uh, institutional settings. It's fantastic to see so many people here. And uh, just as a, a, a quick sideline, I was around when Student Voice uh, Australasia was in, an, in its infancy, and it's come such a long way. And well done to uh, all those who have taken part in, uh, in the growth of that. And Sally's here, and uh, well done to Anna and the, the team who have brought together this program today. So you can see on the slide there um, a couple of things to build on all that has gone before in the presentations today. The, uh, the big idea really is a focus on learner-centered leadership. And I'm uh, talking to you as a group, both in the room and online as leaders, combination of student leaders, staff leaders, and leaders who are learners or who should be learners. I think the biggest mistake we make in looking at the student voice and student voices is thinking that it's someone else's job or uh, there must be some special group that, um, that makes this happen. But my focus really and my, my key message is that you start with a mindset. It's very easy to jump into actions and uh, initiatives and this 
conference today and yesterday has highlighted many terrific initiatives, really good. And uh, congratulations to all who have presented both posters as well as through the day. But what I want to encourage you to do is uh, to start by thinking about what is the mindset that we have as an institution. And this is right across the institution. Sabrine's example gives a, a great uh, instance of a learner-centered mindset where you bring together uh, in humility a group of students, staff and leaders all around the same table. No one has privilege over anyone else and making sure those voices are as diverse as your population is at the institution. And I really want to emphasize here that while most of us are from universities, it's great to hear about the Student Voice M Initiative in the TAFE sector, in the vocational sector. And uh, as I, I mentioned, one of the points to come, I think we have so much to learn from one another. This is not just a university thing, but uh, in terms of making sure that you can have an impact at a whole of university level, if you take the student partnership agreement as a, as a case study, some of the key principles there are what I've built into this slide. First of all, making sure that it's evidence-based and before jumping into let's evaluate with a survey or let's do X, Y, and Z, let's just step back and say, what is our mindset here? Are we focused on learning from one another or are we focused on just getting a survey done so we can report? Are we focused on having a partnership in terms of co-presentation of the findings or are we simply focused on ticking the KPI box at the end of the day? So I encourage people just to step back before jumping in and to think about what's the mindset driving this. And then from there, you actually have the space to be able to look creatively. And that word creative is really critical because yes, we have surveys, we have a stock standard set of evaluation measures and they have stood us in good stead. But I really encourage you as a collective to be thinking about what are the more out of the box ways of monitoring the outcomes. And I love the question earlier today uh, from Western Sydney to Ryan to say, how do you measure the outcomes? Because that is exactly the question we need to be asking ourselves. And I encourage you to think about creative ways to do that. And the only way to be creative is A, to create the space and B, to bring diversity around the table. And that's not just students, that's not just staff, that's not just people with the title of leader, that's actually a collective. So continue, creativity and continuous improvement means we're continuing to learn about how to uh, implement strategy and how to do the three steps I've got um, to follow. I just wanna leave you with these practical steps. The connection, um, this is a great way to connect with people outside of your institution. But what I also see is connections among portfolios within institutions. Often we work in silos, right? So how are you going to play a role on Monday when you're back at your campus to help to build connections? Is it over Zoom or Teams? Is it bringing a group of people, not the usual suspects, together around a table for a conversation? If you're a leader who has the um, authority to create a committee, then you know you might do it that way, but you don't necessarily need the authority, right? The student voice is just so powerful. So how do you creatively build connections? And I'd like to unpack that in, in a moment in the q and I want to build on something that has been mentioned both in uh, Ryan's keynote as well as in many of the presentations so far. We've talked about co-creation and co-design, but I really want to push you to think about co-implementation and co-evaluation. And Sabrine's already touched on that, you know, not just uh, the DVC academic reporting back to council, but holding one another accountable. That's such a great example of the student leaders and the staff leaders reporting back to the governance leaders, right? And then having a joint conversation around the table. And then uh, finally, this was mentioned earlier today as well. This is all about cultural change. That takes time and 
the courage and the creativity and the culture side of things often and the mindset, these are tacit. We don't see them necessarily. They're not out there and we don't necessarily talk about these things all the time. I think the student voice work that you're doing is about bringing the tacit into conversation and saying, how are we doing culture-wise? How will we know? And I'm happy to share some suggestions about ways to at least monitor culture uh, and uh, to take the pulse from a cultural perspective to see how we're doing as an institution. But there are a few ideas to start the conversation. Thank you so much, Kerrilee. Um, do we have time for a, yeah. So this this might lead quite nicely into what you just said, Kerry Lee. I have a question before we go to q and I have one question that I want to pose to all of the panelists together. Um, so considering your diverse experiences in policymaking, student leadership and higher education governance, what future directions do you see for refining assessment practices and enhancing the impact of student voice and partnership initiatives across different educational sectors? I, I might start with you because so, I think that I think that's a yeah. you just touched on that actually, Kerry Lee. So like you can start. You focus on refining. I think there is a lot of good work already happening, but for me, refinement looks like two things. One is more sophisticated approaches to understanding different ways to bring together evaluation metrics, and uh, by that I mean not relying solely on our tried and tested surveys. By sophisticated to me means you actually bring together what you're already doing, push yourselves to think about uh, alternative ways to use technology, to use AI, go digital, bring people around the table uh, to look at the examples that Sabrine has given, building on uh, the, those examples, look at ways to hear student voices differently and and you know by that i mean not the usual student feedback mechanisms but let's go to where there are silences where are we not hearing student feedback to me sophistication is about saying we've got some gaps here let's figure out how we hear those silences uh and and what voices are in the void if you like um, and secondly, uh, I think um, I go back to my second point. It's not just about having students and staff and leaders come together at the design phase. It's about a commitment to holistic evaluation from beginning to end and right back to the beginning again. Thank you so much. Um, Sabrine Satoshi, Sabrine? Yeah, I'm happy to go. Um, so I think... I definitely agree with Kerry Lee in terms of there is the wider and the rest of the student body that tends to not have a voice when it comes to, again, if we're talking about assessment design and practice, a lot of kind of the experience I had was that, you know, I've got my peers and my friends and I'm getting feedback from them, but none of it is particularly going anywhere. And it's only because I was involved that I felt like I could go and, and take those things to the subject coordinator or the lecturer or the law faculty board and things like that. Um, and again, that does, I think we do need to move away from, you know, we've all got the, the SES survey, those feedback surveys. We always talk about closing the feedback loop, but I do think as universities and as institutions and where we're heading, we do need to be more innovative and creative with how that works. And that can be a whole day um, conversation. But I think on that front, um, we're not kind of seeing that work in a lot of university spaces. Um, and the second thing I would probably say is, when it comes to things like the student partnership agreement, like, of course, I would love if every university had something or something thereof that was similar because I acknowledge that every university space is different. You've all different structures. You'll have different staff and student um, structures and, and representation. But I do think having that as a starting point can make all the world of difference, um, even when it comes to, you know, formalized relationships or having those channels where students and staff feel comfortable sharing that feedback. Um, and again, it's not coming out of nowhere. It's not coming as a critique or criticism at an opportune time. It's coming because staff and students have agreed to engage in a continuous process of um, learning and updating and, and being able to provide that feedback. So I think a form or something similar to an SPA acknowledging the uniqueness of each institution um, is definitely a good starting point to be able to give feedback and continue that work. Thank you so much, Sabrine. 
I'm going to respond as a, a policy wonk. So my response is going to be much drier compared to <laughs> um, what, you know, Carolee and Sabrina are saying. Um, as a policy person, right? So the way the way I look at the world is who's standing to gain power? Who's, who's winning? Who's losing, right? And policy is a process of allocating, deliberately allocating power to different people. And one of the... Uh, really nice moments, I think, in Sabrine's initial response was that the moment where students realized that the initial agreements were being, getting close to agreements, but then who's actually winning here, right? Is it a university vice chancellor, who, whoever that might be? Is, is it an institution that's actually, you know, uh, who's going to sort of stand to gain more from this interaction? Or is it actually being done for students? And the students were able to push back and say, well, look, this is actually you know, not benefiting us, right? So they, it had all the forms of student voice and engagement, but then the affect of that was potentially dangerous. So the fact that the students were able to recognize that and also have that feedback being heard and then, then renegotiate the contract um, is, a, is, is a credit to students, of course, but also to the leadership as well at the university, right? So that's what I wanted to talk about in the sort of capability side of things. Now, staying on this kind of topic of power, and uh, and I think I think it's probably important to recognize that in year 2024, the notion of student voice has been both right and wrong reasons have been heavily performatized. In other words, we, we you know we starting to see a lot of people on LinkedIn posting stuff about you know importance of student voice, and I'm a student voice practitioner and all this kind of stuff, right? And that's dangerous because it again raises the question of who's actually gaining power here, right? And that's a that's a, that's a bit of a sort of, you know, the, uh, the post-colonial lens that I'm putting into here, right? Who, who, is, who is looking better as a result of all this kind of thing? So I think speaking of the next step, that, you know, the future directions, I think we can actually acknowledge that there's a kind of, there's, there's both a, a greater recognition of student voice, but then there's also greater risk that it, it continues to be even more performatized. And then as a result of that, the student voice becomes tarnished into a uh, institutional um, instrument, right, to, to, to push whatever the, um, the initiatives that they want to. And look, I, I used to work in sort of secondary school student voice field. Without going into too much details, a lot of um, school councils in Victoria did exactly that. So principals often had their policies or whatever decision they want to put through. They recruited students to school councils, right? And they, 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 they pick handpicked students so they, they, they will support whatever schools are going to do anyway. And then you know, there's, there's a sort of power relation to this pressures and all this kind of stuff. So the students are not going to, not, not many high school students are going to stand up and go like, no, that's, you know, that's BS. We're not going to do that, right? Um, so I think I think it's really important to recognize that there is a healthy resistance to student voice, not not resistance to student voice, but student voice being performatized and being instrumentalized and exploited. So I think that's a really important thing for us to real, realize in the context of 2024. And one of the discussion we've had in the Victorian uh, context in the sort of skills side of things um, was that I think there's a greater need for us to have a greater scrutiny uh, over, you know, whose voice or rather how, how do we actually construct student voice? So what voices do we give more affordance to? What voices do we celebrate? What do voices do we suppress, right? So that we talked about silenced voice and all those kind of things. We do that as in as a, as a system owners or institutions or governments or whatever it is. We 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 you know we pick and choose which voices get amplified and whatnot. So I think it's really important for us to make an acknowledgement, and then you know we need to actually uh, do do a better job at validating not so much validating, sorry, rigorously testing. I suppose our own orientation to voice, and that's what makes this work really complex, but it's also interesting, very impactful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Satoshi. I can see a lot of people nodding in the audience. Well, a lot of what you're saying is resonating very deeply there. Um, I think we have time. We have Q&A now. And I believe that we have the opportunity for the online attendees to ask some questions as well. Um, so Anna might rove around with the microphone. So if you'd like to raise your hands and perhaps introduce yourself and tell us where you're from and ask your question, that would be great. Um, thank you. So my name is Jana and I am the student president at Flinders University Student Association. So I myself, I'm an international student. So I'm also the elected representative, representative for all students at Flinders. So 
with the role comes a lot of student voice, student representation within university, outside of university as well. But um, I'm also on a student visa, which means that I have to study full time um, and, and also perform all of the relevant duties all while, you know, keeping myself afloat. It's been a very challenging year, especially with the time and um, with the changes in the policy making around international students, you know, the the importance of student voice from international students are, you know, have become, you know, more important uh, than ever. So, so um, my question is that, you know, when I looked into other countries and what they do, countries like UK, when international students do become the elected peak representative for the student body, um, the students are allowed to underload for a year or even, um, you know, take a break from their studies to do the representation work and get back to studies. So, as policymakers, do you think Australia will head to a sustained direction? Or what do you think if an international student does get elected into one of those peak representative role, which has lots of commitments and lots of duties and responsibilities, what do you think we should do? Do you want to give the student perspective first, Sabrina? Yeah, no, I'm I'm happy to. <laughs> I think I definitely agree in terms of being an international student. I've worked with a lot of international student um, leaders and people who represent not only international students, but domestic students. Um, and the workload's always been different for them. They've always had even issues in terms of, and we, we had this issue when we were negotiating the SPA is that international students, um, obviously, you know, when it comes to things like negotiation, you want to be a bit fierce, you want to put things on the table, but there is always that thought at the back of their head that I'm on a visa. I'm at the whim of the Australian government, even the university, if it really gets to that point. Um, so again, they've always unfortunately had a bit of a different playing field. Um, and I guess I would love to see in the future, the UK model where uh, if you are in an official student leadership role, you are able as an international student to, to move away from your studies and do part-time. I don't know how that would look in terms of, you know, our legislation right now, the government's priorities. But I think if there is a way, and I'm sure we'll have to have discussion after in terms of as a student representative in the national union, we can work towards putting that on the table and making that a priority. But again, we've always, and I've always lamented with international students, some of the, um, you know, extra responsibilities they have. But again, that's why they're such important advocates and why we need those peak bodies and, and people like you in that in that role. Well, thanks for what you do. That's the first thing. And uh, you're carrying a number of responsibilities. I think um, it's a, a vexed question in many ways because institutions have their own policies in terms of uh, support for student leaders. And, uh, and then you've got at the state level uh, and the federal level. So I can't answer the question about, you know, what will happen in the future. But I think the starting point is recognising the, the combined challenges of leaders who are carrying multiple levels of responsibility and I think a starting point is for institutions to figure out, you know, how how can they improve the support provided for leaders, building capability, uh, and resourcing is always a challenge. So, you know, there's a, a limited amount of money to, uh, to share around within universities. So I'm not going to say here that universities must give more, but I think the starting point is, is hearing that perspective to say if we really want to empower and give agency to our student leaders then let's figure out how we do that holistically across an institution and I think one of the best ways of leading the way is the example of UTS and others this is not the only university doing great things but it's a fabulous example and you know once we get examples of great practice share those showcase them and show others how it can be done. That is one of the best ways of I'm trying to listen. culture, right? So uh, I, I think, you know, there's some of the things. Get Make sure people...
I can only speak to the University of Sydney because I'm a, uh, this is where uh, I study and work. Um, but at the University of Sydney on our Senate, there are only two student members who are fellows of Senates. There may be a maximum of 22. There are currently 15. There's only one elected undergraduate and one elected postgraduate. And as far as democratically elected staff, there are only three members of that staff. So are there any, and in my mind, as like thinking about policy, if we are wanting to enact high level changes to bringing student and staff representation to the highest levels of university management wouldn't be an elegant solution be to in the legislation it says the you know, the university city senate may have to have to up to 22 fellows of senate more student and staff represent voices at these high levels um so have there been any conversations uh at uts in your experience or is this a conversation that say the national union of students is interested in having great so i We'll start with the UTS level and then go to what's kind of happening happening nationally because I wear two hats, the UTS academic board and then national union. So with UTS and its kind of structure, a little bit biased, but we we the students have over 13 positions on academic board. It is a board of 50. However, we have always felt that because of the work of great student leaders before me, that there is genuine voice there. For example, you don't show up at academic board with 50 other staff members and, you know, you're just there as students knowing you're, you know, not valued. What do I do? I'm not really going to speak up in, t in front of all these deans and vice chancellors and provosts and everything. So what was implemented a couple of years back was um, the academic board chair does a briefing the Monday prior to the academic board where students talk to the academic chair, they have the papers, they read the papers, they ask all the questions they want. If there are things they want implemented or changed, they have this forum to be confident enough to walk into academic board feeling like they can speak with context and understanding of um, the university and, and how they can implement these changes. So they're bringing an informed voice to academic board because then, because again, sorry, there's 600 pages of, of academic board papers and no student is really going to feel confident um, reading that and feeling like they have all the information to speak in front of 50 other academics. So when it comes to specific governance structures, um, that isn't something that we have had discussions with because we're at a comfortable place. One more thing about UCS actually is a couple years back, um, right before I kind of joined, we wanted an extra student spot for indigenous indigenous student. And that was something led by the students. We said, all right, we've got one from each faculty. Um, we've got the student union president. We don't have any Indigenous student representation and unfortunately they tend not to be elected in those member roles for, for a variety of different reasons. And, and that got elected, that got passed through the governance procedures, spoke to the academic chair, spoke to the secretary of the university, did the vote. And so we've been in pushing those reforms. But again, I come from a very UTS centric perspective. However, in terms of the national space, um, are you all aware of the university accords that have been happening recently? Um, hopefully generally. So that's where a lot of the conversations has happened about the university structures in general. I will say that we didn't touch on governance of universities because even as a student, I can admit that there potentially would be some overreach there because each university has their own um, kind of institution, institutional structure that is already decided and is connected to the various forms of leadership that they have there. But within the accords, um, I can't remember the exact wording, but they, they did touch on student leadership. There was a lot there that I won't get into that was really like, for example, the student ombudsman that is being set up to uh, explore examples of sexual assault harassment on campuses, complaint systems, things like that. The National Union was very involved in, especially something we are very, very happy with. And again, this is going to change the landscape of student unions and student representation is the minimum requirement that a student union or association has to get 40% of the SAF fee. So for example, um, again, I won't go on too much, but right now at UTS, we only get 11%. So we get 11% of that, that fee. And then we have to spend that on student services, free food, um, you know, counseling, things like that. Um, but now the minimum is 40% and there are more stringent requirements and requirements on how we can spend that. However, that has absolutely given power to the students when it comes to student money and student hands. Um, so again, all those conversations were happening with universities as an institution, However, I think when it comes to the actual governance of each university, that is going to be quite university specific. And I do, and I would hope that um, students have space to have those discussions, but if they don't, that's where things like an SPA student partnership agreement comes into it and comes into play. So Thank you, Sabrina. Um, do we have any more questions? Yes, we have a question over here. We probably have time for 
maybe two or three more. Thanks, Sabrina. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Um, my name's Kerry Lee Lockyer. I'm from the University of South Australia. Another Kerry Lee. <laughs> um, it's a strange experience for me. Um, my question is around evaluation in general. Um, so evaluation, I feel, is a bit of an edged word because it implies that there's an outcome. Uh, and the people that are being evaluated when it comes to sort of student voice initiatives uh, tend to be the students or how they experience a student-led initiative, for an example. So I'm just wondering how we can preserve, uh, I suppose, that information as it travels and gets recontextualized through the process of evaluation so that students or those who are being evaluated still have power over the outcome. Great question, Kerry Lee. Thank you. Satoshi? Yeah, so um, so just want to clarify, so is outcome of evaluation is what you're saying? Yep, yeah, yeah. And I speak as a government employee. I mean, the you know, I'm not going to say any more, but the, you, you know about sort of how governments employ, uh, evaluate things and their vested interests and whatnot. I'm not going to say any more than that. Um, um, I think, yeah, so uh, your, your point that uh, the students are sometimes, you know, put under kind of, not so much as to put it on the microscope, but there, there's a kind of like unfair amount of burden that's carried by students. And it's already, you know, it already happens at a sort of program level. And then if, if it were to happen during evaluation level, noting that some students, you know, some students may be willingly, you know, um, participating in this kind of evaluation process to say, particularly talk about, you know, the, these, I was a bit disappointed by this or whatever, not it was, right? So, and it's, first answer is to make sure that these uh, sort of, critical, right, not, not the negative, but critical, constructively critical comments are actually properly captured. And that falls onto the capability of people who are leading evaluation, right? So as a government employee, I can contract evaluator to do the work. I can tell them to suppress any negative, you know, uh, information. I mean, that's that's an integrity issue on my part, right? So I'll make sure that evaluation is actually being done to evaluate the program. So that's, that's on us. Um, one way to do conduct evaluation in the way that doesn't place the sort of unfair, you know, epistemic burden on students is to actually take a fairly scientific approach in um, uh, the, the sort of program design and implementation. Um, what, what's a good example I can provide anyway? What I, what, what I mean by scientific is, is kind of, you know, you, basically when you start the program, the program areas, in this case, the government, uh, should be actually articulating what are the sort of clear initial problem statements are, right? What are the sort of problem we're facing here? And what are current starting hypotheses on what might make a difference? So you, you make you make the sort of like, you make sure these things are clearly documented as an initial hypothesis and all these kind of things. And as we carry out the program and assuming that, you know, we do the right things by engaging students and collaborating with students and all, all that kind of stuff, we make sure that the sort of what are the sort of inputs made by students uh, along the way you are, and then what are the sort of changes that are made to our those problem statements and hypotheses are. So, in other words, how do we actually use student voice to test our own assumptions um, uh, to make sure that the sort of there's a kind of greater fidelity or there's a greater impact, or to realize that we are kind of uh, heading in in the sort of wrong direction. So therefore, therefore, we have to pivot and all those kind of things. That's probably. Um, that's probably like a neat way of doing it without actually requiring students to speak to the evaluators and, you know, say, you know, we made this impact or whatever, because there's, as I keep saying, there's all, there's always um, danger of kind of performantization, right? People say things that people want to hear and all these kind of things. Yeah, so I think, I think just to make things as, as scientific as possible and, yeah, having a really clear documentation of how things have evolved over time, including through the engagement of students, but also as a sort of new data and evidence become available um, is probably, um, yeah, my suggested approach. Uh, maybe I'll add something from the perspective of being potency. Um, one thing I think that worked really well because that was a real risk that if the onus was gonna end up on the students for doing this work um, and again, you know, it was just there as a piece of paper that UTS got to, you know, form, we, we, we signed it. Um, and it really came down to the simple fact of delegation. Like on the PowerPoint slide that had some of the initiatives, we had 
who was responsible and which area. So we had the DVC's office, the student union, um, uh, UTS marketing in terms of we wanted more engagement with our student elections and things like that. So we said it's up to you know UTS marketing to actually take a role and through their channels um, support that. Um, and something we're actually working with 2.0 that we noticed again after the evaluation period is that when we put things like the DV DVC office or even UTS marketing, we actually needed specific names. One of the issues was actually that you're giving it to kind of a, um, you know, a team uh, when one person doesn't take um, own um, initiative or accountability, um, then it's very easy, you know, like generally with teamwork, people experience that unless you allocate it to someone, it might not get done because it's across too many hands. So that's something we did to be able to avoid, um, you know, the onus being on one person or one group. Thank you so much, Sabrina. And I think we have a question or two. Oh, yeah, also, this will be the last one, but there will be time to mingle and network outside, so I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Melissa Zakanini. I'm from the University of Wollongong. Um, I just wanted to look back to something that um, Carolee offered when you spoke. You said that you might be able to give a few um, checkpoints or things that you might think about when you're considering culture, which I think is so incredibly important. So I guess it's for all three of you, but, you know, what are some of those things that we can keep an eye on? Um, yeah. So it's a fascinating area because often people say, oh, culture is just, you know, it's it's nebulous and uh, how could we possibly look at how it's demonstrated? Well, the first thing is to actually sit down and say, what does culture look like in our institution? And it does take the leadership of the institution to own that. But if they're not doing that, then certainly anyone students and staff who want to have this conversation can uh, figure out how to start the ball rolling. And ways to do that uh, are, first of all, holding one another to account around the espoused values of the institution. And it starts with values. All of your universities have a statement about their mission and their purpose. Go back to that as number one. Often they are accompanied by a set of values, what we stand for. Go to those and then very quickly say, so how do we know? What does that look like? What does it look like in practice? And simple ways of bringing that to the forefront and bringing that to the surface include where do we see people actually living out those values? Let's talk about that. Let's tell the stories about that. Let's celebrate that. Let's also and this is where leaders really are the starting point. They've got to live the walk, walk the walk and talk the talk. If those values are not being lived out and exhibited, let's figure out where we see examples of that and do something about it. And it, it can be as simple as one value a week, one value a month, whatever it is that you, you um, as a leadership group or as a student leadership group, you can talk about the fact that you're focusing on culture by starting with values, celebrate it, and um, feature it, you know, in whatever communication you have. Start using the words that you say about yourselves as an institution that matter. Start using those words and put flesh around those to, to bring them to life. And uh, as I said, holding yourselves to account when things are not working and owning that. Don't try to sugarcoat it. Uh, make sure that there is an honesty about the conversation. And, you know, leaders, I have to say, play a key role in, in um, demonstrating how to do this. At the start of meetings that I chair, for example, uh, naming a value and saying, okay, where have we seen that in action? Just taking time out of the day-to-day -day busyness of a university, student leaders can do that. You can do that in academic board, you know, naming the things that matter. That's where culture starts. And we all know examples of where culture goes wrong and where we see examples of culture not being lived out and played out. But uh, it's about bringing the tacit into real conversations, making it as simple as possible as well because all too often people say culture's out there and it's someone else's problem. Actually, this is about culture, right? We're living the culture of valuing a collaborating conversation around student voices and working together. And, uh, you know, let's name it very simply. 
that's a starting point. Thank you so much, Kerry. Was your question about the indicator of cultural change? Is that what you're asking about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna. I'm just. I'm think thinking out loud, right? Yeah. Uh, so, complaint uh, data is an interesting one. So we tend to treat it as a quantitative measure, right? How many complaints has X Y Z received? And that's a dangerous way to go about it because. What matters is actually content of the complaint, right? So think of a, a misuse of pronouns, for example, something that probably people may not have complained about 10 years ago, right? In the, in the same way as mistreatment of uh, students of color or whatever it may be, gender diverse students, whatever, right? A lot of uh, marginalized groups may have self-governed not to make a complaint because you know, exactly as you were saying, you know, international students may feel that they're not in a position to do so, right? So in some sense that, rising number of complaints, as long as we, we can analyze the qualitative data on that side of things, right? It could be actually a good indicator of how the culture is changing. In other words, what do people accept on this campus? Because that's much more important than actually leaders sitting around talking about, you know, we value respect, we, we, we are empathetic people, we value X, Y, Z, right? That's, that's, that's all and well, but I think particularly the students, particularly those in the, at the margins, are, are, they know when, when those things are lip service. So you want to you want to have a kind of some way of actually capturing that and actually giving, you know, create an opportunity for people to express that. Well, yeah, somebody's not being very genuine when they talk about respect and inclusivity, for instance, or diversity, whatever. Maybe, right. So, yes, I think it's I think I think we need to kind of like look at the new way of thinking about um, um, kind of complaint or whatever data as a sort of indicator of change of the culture as opposed to. Thank you, Satoshi. I might need to gently come to a close. Uh, we could go on and on. Um, thank you so much. And for our online attendees as well. So today's panel discussion was on measuring the impact of student voice and partnership initiatives. And I did say at the very beginning that um, our panel brought with them um, very unique expertise. And I think now you might understand why I said that. So I can't thank you enough. It's been an honor to get to know you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, our wonderful panel.